Um, thanks for coming. Um, I am by nature a pessimist. Uh, and seven years ago, yesterday, I went to see my mum, uh, and uh, uh, it was sort of morning time, and I went to see her, and uh, she said, have you voted, she said, and I said, not yet, I'm going to vote later, and she was very worried, and, uh, and she said, I voted to remain, which came as a surprise to me, um, but nevertheless, she voted to remain, and I, I said, oh, and she said, I'm very worried about the economy, you know, I, I think it's really terrible. Uh, so I said, okay, mum, don't worry, don't worry. I've been on the losing side of every major uh, political discussion in Britain for, for all my adult life. You'll be fine. Uh, so the result came as a, a, a shock uh, to me. It shouldn't have done. Um, the, the political science evidence was pretty clear which way it was going to go. Um, it shouldn't have done, but it did because I l work in the heart of Romania at the London School of Economics. Uh, I live in a, a, a leafy Romanian suburb. Uh, you know, my whole world is, you know, I live in, in, in Romanian country, and so I wasn't attuned to it. Plus, I'd lost every, be on the losing side of every major political discussion uh, for the previous 30 years. So um, uh, it was a very welcome uh, uh, shock uh, when it happened, a huge blow against what we can now see very clearly is our very stale, exhausted political oligopoly. Uh, and it's one in which the, uh, it was a blow in which the electorate rightly understood that the European Union was, was a key factor in uh, their exclusion from political influence in Britain. Uh, and uh, 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 so um, in that sense, um, I was wrong. My pessimism was unfounded. About two years later, was it two years? Yeah, about two years later, we founded, uh, together with some other academics, I founded a, a, a network called The Full Brexit, and that was in the heat of the battle over Brexit, uh, the second referendum, and Parliament was paralysed and all the rest of it, in 2018. And um, after we had our first meeting, uh, I said to one of my colleagues in that group called Kostas Lapovitsas, uh, an economist from SOAS in London, that our job, what we were going to do, was take levers, take pro-Brexit people through the defeat, through the elite's way of no European Union, no referendum against the European Union that had ever been successfully implemented in any other country. Uh, and being a pessimist, I assume that the same would be the true uh, in Britain. It seems to me that the forces reigned against implementing the referendum were very strong, uh, and those against it much, those in favour of implementing the referendum result were quite weak. So, uh, I said to Costas, you know, our job is to take people through the defeat. This was 2018. He said, no, no, uh, Brexit will happen. He said, you're wrong, Brexit will happen. So then on January the 31st, 2020, we all went out for a good uh, a slap-up meal and a, and a booze, a Greek meal, naturally. And um, we, uh, I toasted Costas and said, you were right, I was wrong. We did leave uh, the European Union. Um, and my pessimism was unfounded. Costas had a book launch himself a, a couple of months ago uh, in London uh, for a new book, and I went to it and I said, mm, you know, maybe things are moving back in my direction. You know, maybe uh, uh, I wasn't as wrong as I thought I was, because on the face of it, uh, Brexit looks uh, in a poor way. Um, and um, so, um, it, is it dying? Um, you know, it seems to be, on the one hand, uh, uh, it lacks any energy, the, the people who implemented it, the, the Johnson's gone, um, the Tory party uh, is exhausted. Uh, we were apparently uh, sold a, a, a fake prospectus. I think it's probably true, it certainly would be true. It would be the easiest thing in the world, all that stuff that the, uh, Liam Fox and the Tory Eurosceptics told us, I think wasn't, was plainly not true uh, at the time. Uh, and uh, it's proven not to be uh, true now. Everything looks like a mess in the British economy, uh, and uh, the Remain elite, the civil servants, very clearly, the civil service uh, uh, very much at the front of this, but also in Parliament are getting their revenge uh, on the Brexiteers who are in a very weak uh, position. So uh, it looks like Labour will be elected at the next election. Um, uh, they have, as far as we can tell, not much to offer. Uh, my prediction was, will be that they will be very strong in the area of um, authoritarianism. They will be very good at injecting new blood, or, or they will work hard at injecting new blood into the liberal elite, um, using identity politics 
as the way to uh, as the way to, to work out who's on side, uh, who they can rely on. It will be nasty, uh, I suspect, but we'll see because they won't be very strong. Certainly, they'll be making every effort to cosy up to the EU again. Um, that's uh, David Lammy's made that uh, completely clear. So, is Brexit dying? Well, notwithstanding the fact that I'm a pessimist, I'm a lot less pessimistic about that, actually. Uh, I don't think it is, uh, for three reasons, and that's what I'll talk about because that's what's in the book. Um, the first one is that going back into the European Union is just very unlikely. I mean, it's not, you can't rule it out, uh, but it's extremely unlikely. Um, the EU has problems enough without taking back Brexit Britain. Uh, and for anybody who cares to look, those problems are very, very serious. You know, the, the recession is, is ahead of us. There will be a recession in Britain, there's nobody, no doubt about that. But the recession in, in Europe is ahead of us. Um, the Eurozone uh, is as sclerotic and uh, disastrous as it was. So um, uh, it would be a big political win for the EU to take Britain back. You can see that, and Guy Hofstadt likes to, to tweet about it a lot, how excited he is and how we're welcome to come back. But the risks will be very uh, high. The EU is unlikely ever to give the UK the special terms that the UK had um, prior to Brexit. Um, and the UK, I think, you may disagree, but it, uh, we're, we're, we're speculating a bit, is unlikely ever to vote uh, to join the euro. Um, I think it will be unlikely that any uh, nation um, now would vote to join the euro. So um, rough as things may be for Britain in the next couple of years, the EU is going to look a lot less attractive over time. Uh, so, so in that sense, I think that that ship may have sailed. Second reason to be optimistic uh, from the point of view of uh, the Leave vote and, and Brexit uh, is that Brexit has done so much good already. Uh, you may not, <laughs> that may be a counterintuitive uh, proposal to you, but uh, that's what I, I want to explain. Um, in the first chapter of the book, we, um, we explain what the European Union is, which, given how much we've endlessly been talking about it, or we did for five years, uh, a few years ago, is poorly understood uh, in British politics. Um, it's not, uh, the EU is neither the benign internationalist project of pooling sovereignty that the uh, Europhiles say it is, but nor is it a foreign superstate that rules over Britain, which was the Eurosceptics uh, line. Neither of these things are true, and, and the fact that neither side understood what Britain's membership really meant is one of the reasons that the uh, Brexit process has been so tortured. The European Union is the way that the political class and the political elites of each of its member states rule their own, mem their own country. Um, they meet to get to the way the British elite ruled Britain. They meet together in, in uh, diplomatic forums, essentially. That's what the European Union institutions are. They're treaty-based international diplomatic institutions, usually most of it done behind closed doors without even minutes being taken at Council of Ministers meetings. Um, and there they cook up the laws and the policies, which then automatically, by virtue of the treaties, uh, became domestic uh, law. And the important aspect of that is that it means that for our, uh, the upper echelons of our state system and all the surrounding penumbra of, of um, quangos and, and NGOs and think tanks, the, the relationship that people have with the elites of other member states are much more important to them than the relationship they have with the citizens of their own member state. It's in those forums that people like myself, professors at so-called elite universities, and you know, the directors of NGOs, and senior civil servants, and politicians and ministers, it's in those forums that they get their policy ideas. It's in those forums that it matters what people say. If you remember, the, the best photograph that came out of Brexit was Theresa May being shunned by the other, min the other prime ministers and presidents at uh, some big EU gathering. And it was like the shameful image, because that's the, the forum that matters. That's the forum at which our rulers uh, acquire their own sense of their legitimacy, their right to do what they're doing, and that it matters, and that they're doing the right thing, and that they're doing a good thing. And that's much more important than their relationship with their voters, or with us, the citizens. Now, what Brexit has done is it has wrecked that system in Britain. It, is, it has not fundamentally destroyed, it's not completely destroyed it because our rulers can still go to the United Nations or to the 
International Panel on Climate Change or uh, the World Health Organization. There's no shortage of international organizations uh, where our, ruling, our rulers can hang out uh, and, get, uh, and, and feel good and, and, and feel legitimate and get some policy ideas. Uh, but the European Union was undoubtedly the most developed form of this uh, uh, way of, of governing uh, and the one in which our, our leaders were most uh, engaged. And believe me, at a place like mine, where the good students want to be is in those kind of environments. I mean, I teach law, so a lot of them just want to be in the magic circle, making a fortune uh, in the commercial law firms. But the ones who are on the light side, on the public law side, that's where they want to be. Um, so um, in chapter four of the, the well, leaving, so Brexit has wrecked this system or, or, or seriously damaged it. Uh, and it's in the process, it's exposed the nature of our political parties and our political class. Uh, for 30 years, they relied on this system as a way of governing, and then suddenly it was gone. And in, the, in chapter four of the book, we, we go through the process of um, uh, uh, Brexit itself that you'll, you, I'm sure you all recall the four years of, of uh, political chaos uh, that uh, we went through. Uh, as Parliament couldn't uh, decide what to do. And we look at the way in which each of, each of the main... We identify four tendencies in British politics that fought that struggle out and how each of them uh, were exposed and exhausted in the process. So Liberal Remainers, the, 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 the dominant group in Parliament, the sort of Blairites, the, the Remainer Tories and the Liberal Democrats and the SNP, when they, they were faced with the authority of the people in the form of the referendum, and they, they struggled really hard to get around it, the second referendum was the best bet, was the best way of doing it, to get a second referendum and say, oh, we didn't know what we were voting for, but now we do, and so um, we'll have another referendum. And they got within nine votes of parli in Parliament of, of getting a second referendum. But when it came down to it, they couldn't pull the trigger. And they couldn't pull the trigger because it would have been a nightmare, the second referendum, and they knew it. And they would have paid, many Labour MPs would have paid the price, uh, they eventually did anyway, but uh, at, at an election uh, for, for, uh, for going that way. And uh, uh, underlying that is the fundamental nature of the European Union. They could, they did not have a, a, a superior source of political authority to the British people. The British people had voted in a referendum that Parliament had asked for, made the decision. Parliament didn't like it, the majority, but when it came to it, they didn't have a higher source of authority. The European Union is not a state. It doesn't, it's not a super state. It's not the super state of the Eurosceptics raving in imagination. It is, it is a collection of states uh, whose rulers meet together in those forums to, uh, uh, to evade the authority of their own peoples. That's what the European Union is. It's a system of evading political authority that rests uh, within the states. So that was the Liberal Remainers. They were stuck with that and uh, uh, um, uh, they, they, they couldn't resolve uh, the problem, uh, although they could cause a lot of difficulty uh, and uh, disruption. The Corbynistas turned out to be the other element of Remain, and they magnificently proved the death of British socialism in the process. They... they uh, uh, they turned out they were willing to give the workers whatever the workers needed, free broadband, fully automated luxury communism, you name it. It was there in Corbynite propaganda. The only thing they weren't willing to respect was their political equality. That was the only thing that they weren't, the socialists weren't willing to respect uh, of the working class. Their poorer supporters had overwhelmingly voted for Brexit and they said, sorry, uh, we're not interested in that. Uh, and the Labour Party has played a fundamental and historical price for that. Um, they are liberals in thin disguise. That's, uh, that, that's British socialists. They're not serious uh, about uh, their own claims. Then there's the Tory Eurosceptics. This is faction number three, as it were. The Tory Eurosceptics, apparently victorious uh, in the end, uh, but they couldn't win on their own terms. Neither in 2016 at the referendum nor in 2019 when Boris Johnson won did they really run on a Thatcherite deregulation program. They said that that's what the, that is indeed was their position, the, the dominant position amongst them, was that they were you know, low tax, deregulation, Singapore on Thames and all of that. But when they actually, in the referendum campaign, it became about NHS spending and migration and wages. And then in 2019, Johnson had to get Brexit done on uh, levelling up and investment. Um, these are not uh, Thatcherite themes. 
the whole process proved uh, um, the, uh, the end of all of that. And what has happened in the subsequent period um, shows that there's nothing to that politically. The reason there's nothing to the Thatcherite program politically, Liz Truss's catastrophe is obviously the, uh, the point at which that became very clear, is that very few of us want it. Very few of us, it's about 5% of the electorate actually support low tax deregulation. Even most conservatives think taxes should be high. So very few of the population are interested in that because that was the, whatever you thought about it when Margaret Thatcher did it 30, 40 years ago, it was 30, 40 years ago. Um, and uh, the British electorate wants something uh, very different uh, from that. They want precisely the investment uh, in public services uh, and investment in high-skilled jobs uh, and better wages and so on that, um, uh, that the 40 years of there is no alternative to the market has denied them. So uh, what the Tories could do in power was impose the globalist-inspired emergency regime uh, which clamped down on civil liberties uh, and ran a massive fear campaign in the face of uh, a, a serious uh, public health problem but uh, certainly one that didn't need to be managed in that way and as it's now we're now discovering um, it's going to prove to be an, a catastrophe in the long term both for public health for education and has already proved a catastrophe for equality for social equality and economic equality in Britain. They were able to deliver that, and they've been able to deliver a proxy war in Ukraine. I mean, they're a small bit part in, in that. Obviously, the Americans are far more important, but they've been able uh, to do that. So, um, what these, so there's the first three, the socialists, the, the liberal remainers, and the Eurosceptics. They are what's left of Britain's 20th century political traditions, and they've all shot their bolt. Um, there's, there's nothing there, and we can see that now uh, on the surface of British politics. The fourth group was the populists, was uh, Nigel Farage and, and the Brexit Party, uh, who actually were the force that got Brexit done, like it or loathe it. They got Brexit done by terrifying the Tories uh, into doing it at the European elections in 2019. Um, they did it precisely by standing on the authority of the people. It was, a, it was by saying... Uh, whatever you think of the referendum result, it's what we voted for. If you respect democracy and the political equality of citizens, um, that's what should happen. Uh, and that's how they uh, uh, got Brexit to happen. Um, but in the book, we argue that, they, that well, they were unable to sustain that beyond 2019. They handed it over to, to Johnson, in effect, after 2019, and, that, and he ran on his populist programme. He couldn't deliver on a populist programme because he had a party that didn't really believe in it, um, and uh, eventually uh, got rid of him. Uh, and whereas uh, Farage and the populists didn't really have party organisation, first past the post, obviously, uh, would have fr frustrated them to some extent. But in the book, we argue there's a deeper problem with populism. Uh, there's just a deeper problem. It's one thing to invoke the authority of the people in a referendum. A referendum pops up. You can say, well, the people voted this way, therefore well, I have the authority of the people to say we should leave the European Union. It's a very different thing to maintain that authority over the long run, to maintain uh, the political authority uh, to say, I represent the people um, in the long and the day-to-day -day of politics. That's a much more uh, difficult affair. And in the book, we, we, we invoke a core principle of the political theory of England's greatest uh, philosopher, uh, someone who we don't revere enough in this country, uh, Thomas Hobbes. And you'll see on the front cover of the book our Studio Ghibli version of, uh, of Leviathan, the famous, if you know it, the famous cover of uh, his book Leviathan. Uh, where the people in the form, he, he has it in the form of the king, ours is in the form of, the, of a democratic uh, form, um, that the people rise up over uh, the land uh, to rule it. Um, Hobbes's point is that without a representative who has real authority, in England's case a parliament, a parliament that has real authority with us, in other words we, uh, we uh, understand it to be our representative, the laws it makes are our laws. Without that institution, without that representative, there is no people. There is no the people 
We're just, a, you know, we're just a great morass of, of different interests, individuals, identities, tribes, families, regions. W without the representative, without, in our case, the king in parliament, we are just um, a, a, a multitude. And so it is the moment of representation through which we become a people, a nation. And populism, by just simply invoking the people, doesn't. Sp the, pr the problem is, who is this people? And we are in a situation where it's apparent that Parliament no longer has that authority with us. Parliament, which represents us, no longer has that authority. We don't think it does represent us. A recent poll said over 60% of the electorate thought that none of the parties represented them in Parliament. So that's a real problem. If, uh, if you're going to uh, solve the difficulties that led us to Brexit, that's the problem that we have. How do we uh, establish an authority uh, in Parliament or at any other institution through which we can actually understand ourselves to be a nation and not the warring identity groups um, that we are slowly uh, slipping into. So that's a massive problem. Uh, all the, it's not just Parliament. We, I, I, perhaps you disagree, but I, I think it's a, almost, you know, it's a very a majority opinion, at least, that Parliament doesn't represent us. Uh, but even other institutions, the Union of England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland is extremely uh, fragile and decayed. Uh, the Church of England, which, which you know, you might laugh, we laugh at the Church of England, um, but for, us, for centuries it was a core institution of the state. You know, it, it was a way in which people in Britain understood themselves, certainly in England and Wales, understood themselves uh, to be part of a single nation. The monarchy, the crown, well, that still has a bit more purchase, um, but Charles is definitely not Elizabeth. And he's not Elizabeth in a very specific sense. He's plainly a paid-up member of the cosmopolitan elite. Everything he stands for is in, that, uh, is in that area, whereas our previous monarch was much more subtle. Uh, you never knew uh, where she stood because she understood her role um, rather better. Uh, and uh, the best we can say is that Camilla and Kate are going to have their work cut out uh, if the monarchy is to keep playing the role uh, that it played in, in previous years. Only the NHS and the armed forces remain overwhelmingly popular, in fact, with British people in, in polls. And the NHS has really, is in post-COVID, is not the institution it was, I think, in the uh, popular imagination. And the armed forces are hugely reduced. So that might sound pessimistic. I, I'm saying the, the institutions through which we represented ourselves as a nation as a people, have decayed um, seriously uh, over um, the past uh, 30 years. And in the second chapter of the book, just to, to promote it again, we go through how it is that very process of decay in the 80s and the 90s specifically, the destruction of the old national order, which was the welfare state, which itself had replaced an earlier national order, which was the empire. So Britain until the Second World War was essentially an empire, and that's how we understood uh, uh, that, well, I wasn't there, but it's how our grandparents and our great-grandparents understood Britain as an empire. Um, and then that was replaced with the social democratic compromise, the welfare state after the Second World War. And then um, Margaret Thatcher pulled the plug on that uh, in the 80s. Uh, she thought, in the book we go through it, that she had a different version of Britain. Um, you know, she waved the flag in the Falklands and, and uh, she, uh, she talked about Victorian values. But those things came to nothing uh, as politics. All we got was the market without the cohering uh, institutions of the past. So um, that, in fact, is the reason we ended up in the European Union. It's that decay of the institutions through which Britain represented itself as a nation that led our elite to look outwards for legitimacy, just as the Germans and the French and the Italians had had to do at an earlier point because of their disastrous uh, condition after World War II, much more disastrous than Britain. So that might sound pessimistic, but actually it gives me a reason, not for optimism, but to be a bit more, at least invigorated by where we are uh, after uh, the seven years since the vote. Because the third reason is that I think I now understand the opportunity and potential way of, of, of getting out of Britain's stagnant political state. And that, and in chapter five of the book, this is what we talk about, 
that way is to rethink and reimagine who we are as a nation. Um, and many ordinary people want the nation back, um, which Cummings, Dominic Cummings very cleverly, you know, in the, fa in the famous slogan, take back control, that was what he was, you know, uh, channeling that, that, um, that desire. And we very deliberately have called the book Taking Control because we don't think there's any way back. That's the problem. Uh, the conservative Eurosceptics thought that they could go back to the situation before the European Union. But there is no way back. The European Union itself uh, was the, um, the last stage in the destruction of those things. And uh, it seems to us that the nation is a concept that uh, has a great deal of potential uh, uh, politically uh, in the present as an organising concept for a new politics, not the politics of the 20th century, not socialism versus conservatism, laborism uh, uh, versus Thatcherism, uh, but for a new politics that derives its ideas from uh, the, the principle of national sovereignty, and that's a project of nation building. You know, liberals and humanitarians and cosmopolitans, they love to go out and build nations in Afghanistan or Somalia, or they're always building nations, nation building in Sierra Leone. And it's projection, because the places where they need to build nations are in Britain and the United States and in France. That's where the nation building goes. And if we want to go and lecture other people on it, maybe we should look uh, to our own uh, uh, performance first. And nation building, the nation is a project of investment, investment in its people uh, and, and, and its infrastructure, and not just economic investment, political investment too, investment in the, the, uh, the political infrastructure through which uh, we can um, engage in the process of self-government. We need to invest, but we also need to invest in, in productive infrastructure. And the nation is a way, and the national interest, is a way of overcoming the nimbyism, which is at the, one of the core restrictions uh, on the capacity of um, the uh, British state to do anything useful. We also need to integrate a much more diverse population than we had 40, 50, 60 years ago. Uh, and... Uh, the great advantage of thinking through the nation and national sovereignty as the way to do that is that the nation is a project of equal citizenship. It is not a project of diverse identities. It is not a project of difference. It is not a project that is narcissistic. It is a project that's all about me. It is a project of equal citizenship, which is all about us. Uh, and uh, I would put it to you that that's uh, a, a very important um, uh, something we very much need to cultivate in the coming period. And thirdly, we need to, another urgent thing that we need to do is to end the slide towards chaos internationally. Uh, that, I think, today is a particularly gloomy day on, in that respect. It, 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 I'm not clear what, it, it, I'm not sufficient expertise to tell you how uh, strong Putin's regime is in Russia. But of all the, ter there are only terrible outcomes from the war in Ukraine. And the worst one is the disintegration of Russia. Um, so it's a, uh, probably he'll survive this, but, but I'm not an expert. But it's a particularly dark day, I think, on that front. So we need to end this uh, process, uh, this slide, towards proxy war, state failure, and mass migration. Because mass migration is the consequence of these things. People are on the move because their own states, even if their states are, are stable politically, don't offer them very much. And talented young people think Europe, North America, we've got to go. Um, and international national sovereignty, the nation, is, a, is a, 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 a process of respect for national sovereignty. And that's not just our national sovereignty. That's the national sovereignty of everybody. If I respect my nation, if I'm serious about it, I respect other people's uh, national sovereignty. Uh, and the value of that is that it's a challenge and an alternative to liberal cosmopolitanism on its own ground. We're not, national sovereignty is not autarkic, it's not a retreat inwards, it's not, in the contemporary period, nationalistic. It's an internationalist project, a genuinely internationalist uh, project, both for the fundamental reason that if you respect national sovereignty as such, you respect others' national sovereignty, but also for the practical political reason which is that the project of the nation is a real challenge to very powerful interests, the most powerful interests in the Western world at the moment. And if we're going to do that, if, if we are to rebuild our nation and our democracy, it will have to be done 
uh, it will, there will be, there already is, and we saw from Brexit, serious resistance to that. And so we need as many other nations to be doing that as possible. And we need to cultivate good relations with the rest of peoples of Europe uh, in, in, in helping them to realise their national sovereignty. And there's a tremendous opportunity in talking to the Global South in a completely new language, to the rising powers of the Global South in a completely new way. Uh, and to be, for Britain to be ahead of every other country in, in escaping from the uh, decaying structures of the 20th century order, which survived the end of the Cold War in a way that they should not have done, uh, and, and, and we are now uh, paying the price for that. Um, so those are the uh, opportunities. National sovereignty is the road to, to a genuine internationalism, not the liberal, fake, cosmopolitan, front of the plane version as a former director of the LSE once put it, the cosmopolitanism of the front of the plane. Um, but to a genuine internationalism, a solidarity amongst uh, uh, different nations and different peoples. Uh, and it's also a, an alternative to the fake version that the Tories have, Global Britain. Um, uh, so uh, for all these reasons, the nation is, is, our, pro is our proposal. Um, we can't go back, uh, but we can go forward uh, to a new nation. And now I said we can't go back, so how do you do? Is it tabula rasa, you just start again? Uh, that doesn't sound very, that, that our experience of the past 200 years isn't great on that, you just cut it off. Uh, that hasn't always gone so well. Um, however, there is one tradition, uh, there's probably more than one, but there's one we identify in the book, British tradition, which is very, very uh, uh, valuable in the present and that we want to take forward and revive and strengthen. And that tradition is the sovereignty of parliament. It is the core uh, constitutional doctrine uh, and it, it, it gives the British people the capacity to, uh, to do the kinds of things that we want to do. It's a uniquely democratic constitutional uh, order uh, because it's not restrained by judges interpreting some ancient written document. It's just what the majority of our representatives want to do. That's a very powerful and, and possibly dangerous uh, um, uh, a mechanism. Um, but it's a very democratic one. And so in the final chapter of the book, we, we make a number of proposals about where a politics of national sovereignty leads. Some of them uh, will be uh, divisive, and that's in the nature of the politics of national sovereignty. It's democratic. People will disagree. Um, so some of our proposals may, uh, people might not like, uh, but there's a core group of proposals about the Constitution, which I think a lot of people could get on board with uh, as a way of reviving our national life. And they are um, ending corporate funding of political parties. So political parties who stand in elections should only be funded by individuals. And that includes ending not just private corporations, but trade unions as well. Any corporate body should not be able to fund a political party. Making, forcing our political representatives to be much more reliant on gaining real support and keeping it from the population. Proportional representation uh, is obvious. We have to break uh, the uh, duopoly, and I think that's you know uh, palpable. People realise that now. Uh, abolishing the House of Lords, not on the old. Fact, there's hardly any aristocrats sitting there anymore. Um, but abolishing the House of Lords precisely because it, it allows the House of Commons, our elected representatives, to avoid all the serious work. They end up these show business, these show business for ugly people in the House of Commons. They're all grandstanding politically, while the uh, the great and the good who are unelected are doing all the detail work on legislation in the House of Lords. That's how it happens. Um, we've got to end that. We need that our elected representatives doing serious work on our laws and, and thinking about the impact that's going to have on them electorally. So abolish the House of Lords for that reason, but expand the size of the House of Commons. Make it a more effective uh, uh, institution. Make it much larger, uh, closer to the people because we'd have more MPs per uh, elector or more fewer electors per MP and um, but make it do more of the work and make it able to do more of the work and then um, uh, and then the, our other proposal is that we must repeal all the restrictions on political speech there should be no restrictions on political speech apart from direct incitement to commit a crime um, uh, if we want to have a democratic political culture we take our inspiration in making our these uh, these proposals from Another great, and now essentially in the past, but uh, from the Chartists. Uh, the Chartists were the first mass movement for democracy. Uh, they, their six-point programme was different to ours, um, but it 
put forward that the sovereignty of Parliament was the way in which uh, the people uh, could uh, get their voice heard. Um, and our problem as a state is that we're not in it. The problem uh, of the British state is it doesn't have, and indeed this is true of all European Union member states, it doesn't have its people in its political life. Um, and we need to bring the people back into the political life if our politics is to be functional. That's the idea of the book. Thank you very much.